2023, we'll be back to something that is at least partially in person, if not entirely. Um, so we're going to get started here. Uh, we are recording this session and all of you are currently in as guests with your microphones and your video cameras uh, disabled. Uh, if you we can turn those on for you and the chat is still working. So if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat and we'll also be monitoring the um, that as we go along. And if you have something that you want to say out loud, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you at that point and let you ask your question. Um, so um, we're going to get started with a very brief update from me and Sean Boyle on our RFP process, and then uh, we will hand it over to Kyle Courtney for the keynote address. So first off, um, if I could get a reaction from Sean, are you seeing the, the welcome slide right now? Uh, yep, I sure am. Okay, great. All right, I'm going to go ahead and start off with the RFP update. I've got a few slides and then Sean has a few slides. OK, so um, RFP update. RFP is a reminder request for proposals. It's a procurement process and it should be uh, posting today. The RFP should be posting today uh, if all if all goes well. So a little bit of background for folks on the call. I know we've got a lot of people here who uh, may have heard about this peripherally but not been super involved with it. So first off, why are we doing an RFP? Uh, we're doing an RFP for a new library management system, uh, basically because our current contract with Ex Libris for Alma is, is pretty expensive and it's expensive um, on a few looking at it through a few different lenses it is uh, more expensive than other contracts with consortia that are similar to us it is certainly more expensive than what we were paying when we were in voyager and it's expensive just from a we don't have you know funds to to continue paying a three percent increase every year in perpetuity we did um we, our initial terms were uh, negotiated back in 2015 and we did renegotiate those terms in 2019 and did get some some nice concessions from Ex Libris, but still higher than we would want to see. And really the only um, the only uh, way that we could you know, look at getting the prices down further with Ex Libris or with somebody else was then to do a competitive bid process. So that's an RFP. So that's what we're doing. Uh, a concern though that we had is there has been a lot of consolidation in the commercial vendor space over the last 10, 15, 20 years. Competition from commercial vendors is pretty limited at this point. These are a couple of slides from last year's Guggum uh, keynote speaker, Marshall Breeding, who, uh, who talked about what's happening in the library market with uh, integrated library systems specifically. So you can see that uh, these two slides are both from um, ARL libraries, so academic libraries. And on the left, you see uh, the market share from the major vendors. And so you can see that you know, Ex Libris really is dominating the commercial market space in, in academic libraries, at least right now with um, Innovative, who they have acquired now as well. So they also uh, sort of own the, the red as well as the blue. And then Circe Dynex and OCLC coming in with much lower market shares. And then perhaps even more disturbing than that, over to the right, you see just overall what's happened since 1990 in the space of uh, library systems and vendors. You can see that back in 1990, there were 20 different library systems from 16 different vendors. And uh, we're now down to, uh, let's see, about 12 different library systems and only six different vendors in the academic market space. So we wanted to make sure that um, open source was a uh, option that that we could consider as we were doing this this RFP. And so we wanted to start first and 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 talk about whether open source systems were even ready to meet our needs um, and would be competitive in an RFP. So we embarked on an RFI, a request for information, last year to find that out. And the goal of the RFI was not to select a particular vendor. And I've got a little asterisk next to vendor here because it might be strange to be talking about vendors in the context of open source systems. But there are vendors that support open source systems. And for the purposes of this RFI and RFP, that's who we were wanting to talk with. So, but we weren't interested in using the RFI to select a particular vendor or platform or even compare the vendors or platforms to each other or to address every single find it a uh, functional requirement that we might have. Instead, what we wanted to do. Whoops, sorry, let me go back. 
what we wanted to do was to answer the question, are there open source platforms that are close enough to meeting our needs that they would be competitive in an RFP? And the answer to that, you can see um, here, we got responses in the RFI from two vendors on behalf of, of, of uh, Evergreen, the Evergreen system, which is currently used by our public libraries in Georgia, and two vendors on behalf of, of Folio. Equinox and Emerald um, were um, Evergreen and EBSCO and Index Data were Folio. And you can see if you just look at the bottom right here that um, Equinox met about 85% of our needs right now and another 14 that would require some development. Emerald did not do a great job of responding to the questions, so their low numbers there are not necessarily reflective of how well they would actually support it. It's more reflective of they didn't answer some questions on the RFI. And then EBSCO um, and Index Data were not quite there yet when it comes to current functionality, but they have a lot of things that were coming on their roadmap over the next year, and then a few things that needed development. And as a reminder, EBSCO and Index Data were Folio, and Folio was still actively in development, so we weren't that surprised to see that they were, um, had, were missing some of the, the more basic functionality at the moment that we looked at it last year. Overall, you can see the green, you know, this is for the uh, different functional areas. So you see ERM, acquisitions, a bunch of stuff around cataloging fulfillment. Whoops, I keep skipping to ahead. Um, a lot of stuff is in the green for, for all of the vendors and a few things on the roadmap for EBSCO and index data, data and folio. Um, and some things that just, you know, nobody's doing a great job of right now. For example, assessment would really need development no matter which direction we went in. But to answer the question, you know, are there open source platforms that are close enough to meeting our needs that they would be competitive? We felt that yes, there were. And that was the recommendation we took to Rackle and they agreed with that recommendation. And so we have now embarked on an RFP. So this is our sort of rough timeline that um, has uh, that we've been working on for the past two to three years. So um, we're currently here in 21-22 um, fiscal year, and we are on track to release this RFP in sp in spring of 2022. In fact, we're hoping to release it today. It may not uh, may not happen today, but certainly this week. And then we'll be making a decision on that system in, in on 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 the RFP uh, around this time next year, spring 2023, and that if we choose something other than our current vendor, we would then move into a project planning phase for implementation that would take about two years and we would be going live in summer in 2025. Um, if we, uh, if if the successful respondent to the RFP, if the successful vendor is Ex Libris, then we would renegotiate terms with them to take effect in July of 2023 and move forward with them. So um, we have had a lot of input from uh, a lot of USG folks in this process, and I just want to give them a quick shout out. These are the current RFP team members. There are different phases, and Sean's going to talk about those different phases here in just a moment, but we're currently in the planning phase. We're about to move into the you know, posting and evaluation phases. Uh, the co-chairs, Sonia Gaither and Jeff Steely from Rackle, they are uh, two of our, our library directors and have been doing a fantastic job of guiding the team through this process. Gil and Galileo staff over there on the left, um, Barry and Sean have been carrying most of the heavy load here, but certainly input from me, Kevin, Russell and Sean as well. And then the members who are of the team who are doing the bulk of the work and coming up the with the requirements and the um, demo scripts and things like that over there on the right. Most of these folks also served on the uh, the RFI team as well, and we had a few additional members on the RFI I team, including representatives from um, from the public library service, because again, we're looking at a system that we uh, that Evergreen is one of the potential systems that we might choose, and they're currently on Evergreen, and then also representative from the uh, technical college system because they are currently on our Ex Libris contract, and so they're going to be a stakeholder in this as well. All right, Sean, do you want me to keep moving through the slides, or do you want to take over? Sure. Yeah, in okay. the interest of time, we'll just yep. keep keep going. All right, there you um, go. And I'm just going to provide a brief, brief update of about uh, sort of the, the where we are and where we're headed uh, as far as a, uh, a project plan goes. Um, as, as Lucy mentioned, we're out of the, the planning team is sort of officially dissolved at this point, or at least on hold until we post this. Um, and then we're going to move into uh, the formation of an evaluation team so we can evaluate um, the responses to the RFP. Um, and then we will have an observer team that is a small group of folks 
uh, well, there'll actually be a few different server teams. I mean, everyone essentially in USG will get to observe the demos, but there will be a small team that will both observe and um, um, then uh, rate uh, the demos as, as in addition to the responses, I believe. Um, and then finally, after all that comes up, we're going to go into the negotiation uh, phase. And so here's the rough timeline, as, as Lucy mentioned, um, for the um, the whole process, and that is not February 2022-3. That's going to hopefully wrap up negotiation-wise in February 2023, roughly. Um, but we are, uh, as mentioned, um, hopefully, maybe, I th I'm sort of thinking we might get it posted today, but maybe not today, but uh, our, our USG procurement uh, contact has been working um, uh, furiously on getting our uh, Excel spreadsheet uh, loaded into her system. Um, so yeah, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, yeah, as mentioned, planning phase is complete. We've we've transferred all those documents that everybody has worked really hard on over to the procurement office. Um, additional documents beyond the requirements were background information, narrative, uh, statistics, also along with that about our our uh, consortium. Um, a cost worksheet um, and a uh, demo scorecard. So we do have to have an, the ability to to score the demos uh, as they uh, are presented to us in probably October or September ish. Um, and then a uh, we uh, our team also beyond uh, writing requirements, the planning team spent a lot of time working on demo questions and scenarios so we can give the uh, vendor something to. To, uh, to work from as they they demonstrate their product to us um, and procurements in the process are almost done with reformatting those documents and getting those posted um, and then finally future work that we've got um, the RFP will leave it open till I think about mid July these are all sort of flexible ish dates um, we'll get the evaluation team up and running in July um, and we'll begin um, scoring responses uh, July August it's going to move pretty quick over the summer um, and we're going to get the the demos scheduled uh, as soon as possible because they will take a few days that uh, we imagine the vendors will spend. I think we gave them at most five business days to to uh, to do all their demonstrations. Uh, so they'll, it'll be a, we want people to be able to block that off on their schedules for for September. Um, and then we'll move into the scoring and the evaluation phase in October. And then, as mentioned before, we will hopefully begin negotiations in October or November. So that's sort of the the really high level overview of this whole project. And as, as it says there, if you have any questions or comments, you can always always reach out to me. Sean, is there anything that has come up in the chat or does anybody have their hand raised right now? I don't see anything. OK. If anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in there or to reach out to Sean and we'll get them answered. But if there are none, then we'll go ahead and move on to probably what most of you are here for, which is our keynote presentation. All right, so our keynote speaker is Kyle Courtney from the Harvard University Office for Scholarly Communications. Kyle is a lawyer and a librarian. He has a, a JD and with a distinction in intellectual property law, law and an M MSLIS. Uh, he serves as the Copyright Advisor and Program Manager at Harvard University. In 2014, he founded Fair Use Week, which is now an international celebration sponsored annually by over 100 universities, libraries, and other institutions. Kyle is a published author and nationally recognized speaker on the topics of copyright, libraries, and the law. His writing has appeared in Politico, Library Journal, Law Library Journal, and other publications. And his most recent work is a white paper on controlled digital lending. Uh, he also has an upcoming book called Copyright and Censorship, Historical Dangers of Licensing Regimes in the Digital Age, uh, to be published soon by Cornell University Press. And his blog is at kylecourtney.com. Recent posts include um, one called Libraries Do Not Need Permission to Lend Books. A very interesting one also on Blackbeard's Law, which is about <laughs> piracy and how that has a, pi a, a sunken pirate ship and how that has informed uh, copyright law. Uh, especially when it comes to states' rights, and um, a three-part series on COVID-19, copyright, and library superpowers. And in 2020, he founded, co-founded a new nonprofit organization called Library Futures, which empowers libraries to take control of their digital futures. So welcome, Kyle, and take it away. 
Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here today and share you that. Uh, that thank you for the nice bio too. I, I should have you summarize that. That's excellent. <laughs> Hits all the highlights. Um, so what I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to attempt. I'm going to do the hardest part of the presentation for me, which is attempt to use the technology uh, to share the screen. And there we go. Uh, and we'll put it into presenter view. And voila. All right, um, I, I've called this. Uh, I, I realized I didn't give a title, so my apologies to everyone that said, oh, Kyle's going to come and talk about something. Um, I'm going to talk about sharing the remote digital era. Now, obviously, this involves some of the stuff that we've been working with um, here, um, and I just wanted to note um, that, you know, uh, what Lucy pointed out in the, that there are less and less vendors and consolidation also exists in publishing of the materials that we deal with uh, in our library system. So it, it's reflected uh, everywhere and, and that's problematic. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the problems first, then we're going to talk about the solutions. Um, so the last two years that we have all lived through together here, um, what I'm calling the library archive pandemic narrative um, has been uh, stifling to say. Now, at the peak closures, when many of us were closed, we couldn't perform our normal functions, right? So no, no operations, no programs, and, and all of a sudden legally acquired works. The things that we have collected for a very long time in our systems were trapped. Uh, by one estimate uh, online, 650 million books were trapped on the shelves in the libraries that were fully closed. Um, so that meant no physical access. Now, we, we did have drive through access or you know uh, you could reserve a book uh, and pick it up in the car but mostly we had limited or no physical access which meant no interlibrary no no document delivery which meant no reserves to a second offense um, one of my more favorite uh, areas that actually developed we got a new license that developed um, during the pandemic no reading books allowed to children online without paying a license fee um, so we also determined uh, at least through our work uh, with uh, 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 the US Copyright Office, they said that electronic access required permission or licensing only. Now we did have the summer of free. Probably many of you remember the summer of free, um, but that 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 is over now, right? Now it's, now it's the summer of pay. But ultimately it said, oh, print had no value, right? Despite the fact that libraries and archives spent millions on collections that they want to share with their community, it had no value because it was trapped, we couldn't get it, and we needed the license, so we had to pay again. So I, I just like to start off in that that entire narrative is false, right? Just because we were closed, just because things were happening, didn't mean we needed to rebuy our collections, relicense everything, um, and start over. Uh, certainly one organization that uh, had been for the for a full solid decade, been sharing works digitally, um, which was Internet Archive, uh, was sued by the major publishers in a federal district court in New York for sharing books, especially sharing books during the pandemic. That's when that. So I just you know just reminder that these publishers sued a library during a pandemic that was trying to increase access. Now we shouldn't be surprised with this. Historically, we have seen attempts to restrict the capability of us to share our collections elsewhere. Um, Authors Guild sued both Google Books and Hathi Trust for their digitization work. Um, Copyright Clearance Center uh, sued uh, and got along with Cambridge University Press and Sage to sue Georgia State University years before. And what we see is when libraries and archives try to take their destiny in their own hands with regards to sharing their collections, they've been sued or threatened. And that's where we are in our discourse presently. And again, part of it is what Lucy is pointed out, the consolidation right, of these major publishers. Um, and large scale publishers and legal right holders organization have generally argued about anything that would increase access, benefit a library, or more importantly, anything that would benefit communities that libraries serve without restrictions. You know, it could be a restriction of price or access of materials. Now, just to point this out for the moment, this is not new. Everything on the screen in the Internet Archive is not new. There are historically plenty of areas where rights holders and publishers have attempted to curtail a uh, library's ability to share collections. Now I've I've made uh, great work in studying this over time and there'll be a paper coming out about this soon that kind of summarizes all these battles. Um, but the idea that interlibrary loan was challenged, having photocopiers in libraries is challenged, open access, e-reserves, increasing access for the print disabled, that was the Hathi Trust case, text and data mining, of course, control digital lending. And how about let's go further back the fact that the right to borrow and loan books was actually on the table 
as something that that publishers wanted to ban. And I pulled up a work that talked about this. In 1931, Bernays was hired to launch a contest to look for a pejorative word for the book borrower, the wretch who raised hell with book sales and deprived authors of royalties. Now, literally, they were trying to prevent people from borrowing books. And so they came up with these new and different names for you know people who borrowed books, our patrons, the uh, book weevil, Boracle, Libraside, book looter, book bum, book blitz. I mean, look at these names: book in ear, book bummer. So, I mean, for everyone here on this uh, call today, I hope you know, welcome book weevils. We believe in sharing and loaning our materials. Uh, we want our patrons to borrow. So, how can we do this in such a way? And and you know, if you don't see where I'm coming from, I wrote it down in four sentences. Um, I reject the out of control licensing culture, which we currently are subject to, the devaluation of our legal and economic value that we have in our collections, excessively narrow fair use and section 108 analysis. I'll talk about that in a bit. And I reject the fear of technology preventing the uh, the large scale legitimate legal sharing, which our nonprofit educational research and access based missions provide to our communities. So if we reject all that, I don't want to stay negative. I want to stay very positive. Um, I'm going to put I embrace fair use flexibility as a right and you should too. We'll talk about it. I also want to promote licensing culture, but we need to understand we don't need a license for everything. <laughs> um, and I encourage the use of the superpowers that library and archives have and I'll talk about those briefly. Um, they are very important is in the ability to share is knowing those rights and I support copyrights real public purpose, which is to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. So what can we do to increase access and the ability to share our collections in the present? Well, in order to understand that, in, including uh, working with um, you know, the, the law and working with the technology you have, we have to get down to the core question, which is I, I love asking this question. I love teaching this question. How do libraries legally do what we do? Right, because it appears the future that we are encumbered with might be we don't own anything. We are leasing everything. We uh, we have ebooks and e streaming and Netflix and Hulu and the library can't own any of those things or preserve any of things or do anything. So let's get to the core. How do we legally do what we do? Well, from the 10,000 foot le level, and I alluded to this earlier, the constitutional narrative that surrounds copyright law in which we sit libraries have an important place in copyright law, says to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times through authors and inventors the right to their respective writings and discoveries. That's in the Constitution. It's very important. So they created the post office, and next they created copyright right in a row. And the first law that was passed with regard to copyright in this country was not a law for making sure publishers get money. It was an act for the encouragement of learning. It's the understanding that distribution loaning books, sharing materials is as important to copyright. So this is the balancing act that we exist in. Now, for any of you that seen me lecture before, you you know that I use this as the, the method by which I depict the copyright system, right? On the left there is the bundle of rights, right? That is the copyright that is automatically granted to an author or creator as soon as they create it, right? They write the book, boom, they own the bundle. Often they sign it over to a publisher, but we'll get to that in a moment. And during life of the author plus 70 years, they have a limited economic monopoly on that work, right? They get to decide who does what with the bundle. And then after life of the author plus 70 years expires, it drops into the public domain. This is the cycle, and that's where we think of promoting the progress of science and the useful arts plans. Now, What's interesting about any library or archives is that we sit right in the middle of those purposes, those dual purposes, right? We satisfy the economic purpose of copyright, right? That limited economic monopoly. Well, we purchase books, right? We acquire those materials. And then the public benefit purpose of copyright, right? To promote the progress of science and the useful arts. And we share the materials. Congress, when it legislated many, many of the copyright laws, made it possible for libraries to fulfill their vital function in society by enabling the lending of books to benefit general learning, research, and intellectual enrichment of our readers. And arguably, now that we're in the 21st century, should we now use technology to allow this loaning to continue online? We can use the same technology that the publisher used. And I'll talk about that because they're doing it, especially during the pandemic. So back to our, our scenario here. 
the interesting part of the scenario, though, is that the bundle of rights, which is either author owned by the author or publisher, is not owned by us, right? We're we're libraries. We are taking those materials and we are housing them in some capacity, electronic or physical, and we're making them available to others. So we we don't we're not the copyright holder. So where's the conflict there? Now, just to note, I'm not talking about anything that's in the public domain, right? Anything that's in the public domain, we should digitize, share, give to the world as soon as possible. And every year on January 1st, a new uh, year of materials, everything published in 1927, for example, is now in the public domain. And we don't have to worry about, you know, any any kind of licensing rights or anything associated with that. That means it's there. But let's talk about all the other stuff we may have in our collections. Right uh, in various formats. Um, so I'm going to bounce back and forth between issues with sharing our current collections and issues with sharing our future collections here. So let's just let's just look at the bundle for just a moment here. This bundle of rights, this is an important part of copyright, says, oh, you have the right to write copies, derivative works, distribute the copies, perform and display the work. Now, any any uh, any person that works at the library is like, all right, we, sometimes we make copies, right? Sometimes we distribute them. Uh, sometimes we, we we put them online or display them somewhere. So we're using a lot of the bundle, right? And as I said, the libraries don't own the bundle. Well, how does that happen? How do we not get sued out of existence for even just loaning books? Well, that's because when copyright law was set up, it was not set up to restrict everything just to the owner itself, right? So here's a here's a, a screenshot, and I'm sorry for the small font, um, but this is an outline of the beginning of the Copyright Act, the law, right? And certainly the bundle of rights is represented in this section here, right? Mostly section 106, where they decide what is the right that the copyright holder has. Fine, we're familiar with that, but the rest of this section from fair use in 107 all the way down through 122 is all the limitations and exceptions. And those limitations and exceptions help define the ambit of the copyright holders bundle. In fact, the copyright holders bundle says, hey, you're subject to 107 through 122 here. And these are critical and, and and very important. And this is the framework for which we are capable of building and sharing collections. Without this, we would be infringing, right? And they're called statutory copyright exceptions or exemptions. Your words, uh, your choice of words. And they allow anyone to exercise one of the exclusive rights of the copyright bundle without obtaining permission, right? No permission needed and without payment. Now, some of them require payment, but that's music and cover songs and jukeboxes, nothing that the library would necessarily do. But generally, that's how we're able of loaning and doing certain things without permission. Otherwise, we'd have to pay every single time we loaned a book or a work. So how do libraries legally do what we do? Well, the statutory copyright exemptions. What are the important ones? I, I have to hit the highlights here, but I'm going to start with one in which I was not taught this in law school. I was not taught this in library school. I was reluctantly taught this on the job because <laughs> it's not a great section, but it is the superpower for libraries. It's section 108, and it says notwithstanding the exclusive rights of the owner of copyright. Now, very important uh, when they say this, they're referring to the bundle. So notwithstanding the bundle of rights, meaning despite the fact that the copyright holder owns this, Section 108 says that libraries or archives can do certain things, including reproduction and distribution of works. Now, what's been fascinating over the last uh, two years, it's kind of our rediscovery of Section 108 during our closures. And I'd like to say that this is something that can be utilized, harnessed with technology, and, and made more effective for sharing. So, Fair use is for everyone, right? And I'm not going to go over fair use in a great deal, um, but Section 108 is only for us, right? It's only for libraries and archives. Anyone else does the things that we do in their garage or at their home, uh, they are guilty of infringement. Um, so 108 manifests this congressional intent to saying, hey, we should be able to let libraries as you know, cultural institutions copy, digitize, transform, reproduce, and replicate to provide preservation access to our culture. And it doesn't matter. It's not law, textbooks, poetry, manuscripts, art, music, software, anything you have, a library might be able to utilize something under Section 108. So it's also the engine behind document delivery, preservation, and interlibrary loan. It's very big in that area. In fact, that's where I started to encounter it when I was you know, interning uh, through an access department. I came up through interlibrary loan and document delivery in my career. Now, the lesson here 
is that we have, may have not have read this in detail. I have done it for you to, to talk about it, some highlights today, um, but there, there's a great pandemic lesson that occurred that these rights are fairly generous under Section 108 for us to scan and distribute works um, and do it in a way that benefits our community. So, uh, you know, it's written terribly, Section 108. It's got passive language. It starts with exceptions. I've been trying to organize it. And I want you to kind of maybe memorize it. Uh, Section 108 is a test and three buckets of things we can do. And I know that's kind of silly, but it's a way of breaking it down. So the library test is who's the library, who's not. I'm not going to really talk about that today, um, but I do have a presentation called what is a library under the law and is it important that I did for uh, library futures you could check that out sometime but we're going to talk about save it which is about preservation of both published and unpublished and the ability to share those materials digitally the scholars delight I will mention very briefly but that's document delivery and interlibrary loan and then the get out of jail free that we can digitize and share things that are in their last 20 years of copyright right now as we speak we don't have to do anything special so let's start with save it I call it save it and share it. <laughs> this is section 108 B and C, and it's important to note that when this was written in, in the 1970s, they perceived of digital copies, um, and we'll talk about that. But the fact that it, the modern interpretation of this is very powerful, but we don't study this. So let's talk about it. So let's say you have an unpublished work in your library, something that's rare, unique. It is a hazard of loss. You can't find it anywhere else, and you need to copy it. Well, the law says you should be able to make three up to three um, preservation copies as long as it's solely for preservation, right? It's got red rot, it's falling apart, et cetera, and it's currently in your collection, right? You didn't borrow it from somewhere else and you scanned it. Now, that's great, right? So that's okay. We can make a preservation copy of the collection. Now, if any one of those collections is digital, they use some interesting language here. They say that copy may not be made available to the public in that format outside the premises of the library archives. I promise we will come back to this and discuss this because this is the linchpin between being able to share it and being able to put it in a black hole for 100 years and hoping it goes into the public domain. So again, this is an unpublished work that's still under copyright. We can make copies. What about a published work? Different test, but same theme. We can make up to three copies of a published work as long as we are replacing a copy. So let's say you had a fire or a flood or a book was lost or stolen. Those are categories in which you can get a replacement. It's damaged, it's deteriorating, it's lost, it's stolen, or sorry, it's in a format that has become obsolete, right? So you have something that's been damaged in some way. You look at it and you say, okay, I can't find an unused replacement at a fair price. Right? That's up to us to make those determinations. And then we have that language again. However, if we make it a digital copy, then premises of the library. These, these come through interlibrary loan a lot. I got one the other day. Uh, somebody checked in with me from our unit, said, oh, they wanted 108C. It was, it, was, um, it was lost, and they wanted us to make a copy and send this to another library, and we could. Right? We gave them the digital copy, except it's subject to 108C2 premises. So what does that mean? I was uh, schooled in the art of reading this in a way that said I couldn't share it, but that's not actually what the language says. Um, and I was looking at um, uh, one of NYU's projects with regards to uh, preserving and sharing VHS tapes because they are deteriorating. Um, and we they went into a little detail and it said, look, the law says you can make digital copies of unpublished and published works, right? Things that are on our shelves, things that another library meets. And the law in governing that is not made available to the public in that format outside the premise of the library. Now let's put aside that access to digital copies could be done under fair use, right? We're not discussing that. We're just discussing section 108. So the act does not define what I think is the critical term here as to the public. So you have a digitized copy. You're like, can I share this? Well, it doesn't define to the public. So could a library um, serve a discrete user community that's distinct from the public at large? Now, if you're an academic library, I would argue, well, a small subset might be faculty and students at a university. That's not to the public, right? You have to come in, tap your card. What about sharing off-premises access to these digital copies in certain situations, classroom use? 
um, such as uh, use for those that are library card holders. Not everyone has a library card. There's a distinct community. And so this language to the public, I think, is more narrowing than we think. So as long as it's not to the public in that format outside the premises of the library, meaning, oh, OK, well, what if they log behind a pin wall? What if they have to have a library card? What if they have to be a member of this institution? And and I, I'm, I'm guessing this because to the public means something else other than just it's open and available. Um, so I think these section 108 requirements, if we're actually reading these, as long as we're not making it to the public in that format, we should be able to share these digital copies. And that's an amazing thing. We could share these digital copies. We did not know we could do that under 108 until kind of very recently. So the lesson here for 108 B and C for digitizing copies of unpublished and published works that require some digitization. Well, the made available to the public outside the premise of the library archives interpretation is informed by the statute's language affirmed by community practice and advanced by the technology available which we have, right? We're just talking about vendors beforehand. What technology is available for us to be able to share stuff? So that's that's 108B and C, and that's just kind of a, a taste of this. Scholar's Delight is 108D, E, and G. Uh, basically, can a library or archive scan copies requested by users and share it with them? Absolutely, right? 108D, in case, I, I mean, when I was reading this to come up with these tests, I was thinking to myself, you know, wow, we have the tech to do this. Can we do it under the law? And that's, that's balance. Sure, 108D says articles, book chapters, or short works. Now, it doesn't define what a short work is. I think that's up to you, uh, but it's a test. The test is, all right, if I digitize this thing, and when I give it to them, it has to become their property. So I don't keep, I don't keep the digital file. Um, it's for private study, research, or scholarship. So it's not for our commercial industry. They're not saying, oh, we want to use this to build a company on. And that we have to have the copyright warning notice on any request, print form, or web, right? And that's we many of us do that already. So that idea that okay, so I can copy a book chapter, copy an article, short work, and give it to someone. I can share it with them. Here you go. What about full books? Well, you can. If the work's out of print, you can scan a copy of an entire out of print work, as long as it's uh, unobtainable at a fair price. It becomes property of the user. Private study, research, or scholarship, same as the other test, and the copyright warning notice. Now, that's the kind of thing. The only thing that's different here is determining whether it's available at a fair price somewhere else. And that's up to the person that's searching this, the librarian, possibly acquisitions or collections, that idea. But th this is this goes against the grain. A lot of people tell hold me they weren't sure that this was real because an entire out of print work, you can scan the whole book and give it to someone as long as it's out of print and it satisfies the rest of this test. That's an amazing thing. Now, I've been saying the word book a lot for 108 D&E because there's something specific there about this. Digitization rights provided to libraries and archives for D&E do not extend to musical, pictorial, sculptural works, motion picture, or audiovisual works, which is kind of the bummer, right? <laughs> that idea that, oh, well, we can't do this for, you know, Star Wars or movies or, you know, an art book or something like that. So VHS, music CDs, art, photography books, DVDs, they're often still under copyright because of their the nature of their work um, and they're maybe more modern. But again, determine the risk. We're not talking about fair use here, but this is a great area for fair use to reign uh, because, you know, 108 D and E, we can't, we can't use those. We can't copy the whole thing or portions of it, but we can use some of it. Now, I'm not going to talk about your library loan, but 108G does the same thing. We've been using enter library loan for a long time. I don't want to uh, get into that, but certainly we've been in that space for a long time. What I do want to talk about is digitization using the last bucket of 108, uh, which is 108H, and then I'll move on to a, another topic here of sharing. But this is called the last 20 years. Um, for those of you that have heard of this, it's kind of interesting. I call it the little used and serious 108H. This was given to us um, in the 1990s, late 90s, when the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act was passed. It's when we moved from life of the author plus 50 under copyright to life of the author plus 70. And basically it says, dear libraries, you're allowed to share copies of digitized works as long as they're in their last 20 years of their copyright term. So you have to discover that, of course. But that idea is all it requires is another little test. Again, 108 is a bunch of tests that to satisfy to digitize and share. So 
the work has to be subject to not subject to normal commercial exploitation. I don't know what that means. They don't define it either. Cannot be attained at a reasonable price, different than fair price. And you have, uh, <laughs> and the copyright office has not received a notice from the copyright holder that says, please don't 108H with stuff. Now, real fast, the copyright office has never ever had a notice from any copyright holder ever about this, this 108H. So that's good. It's not on their radar. Um, reasonable price is entirely subjective and up to you. And subject to normal commercial exploitation is not defined under the law. I like to think still in print or available perhaps, but imagine that. Imagine you went into the collection and you did a little copyright public domain research and you found, hey, some of these works are in their last 20 years of copyright. Let's digitize them and put them online. Now, one library that did do this is Internet Archive. They actually named it the Sonny Bono Memorial Collection. Um, and so that, I think that's kind of interesting uh, naming it after him, but uh, and it's part of their last 20 project. And this was launched by a colleague of mine, Dallin at Tulane Law, who was studying 108H, Elizabeth Thompson Guard. She's a copyright professor and a friend. Um, and they posted these works. Now, these are available full text online. They're in their last 20 years of copyright, and they meet the test under 108, uh, 108H. So you can go in and just look at these. Again, these are full text versions. Now, the library or archive is allowed to share this, right? If somebody comes along, downloads it, and does it something nefarious with it, that is not on, on the library or archive. That is on them. We have the right to make these available. And that's an incredible thing to share. Your collections might have a lot of stuff that are in their last 20 years of copyright. So an increased understanding and use of Section 108 rights is a big part of what I'm kind of promoting here today because you can digitize and share collections now, right now under 108. Obviously for purposes of preservation security, for deposit in another library, for rare, the lost islands, for scholarly use by a, a patron, maybe for a discrete group um, under the 108 uh, B and C, as we talked about, and then that 20 year window during the last years of copyright. So these are these are three or four very key areas in which we can do something now using the technology that we have. So that's just 108. I know I took longer on that than I meant to do, but let's get into the next one. Back to the bundle, right? We have a collection, we have a material in our library. Um, we want to loan it to people, right? However, the copyright holder has a bundle of rights. The copyright holder has the right to determine who gets to distribute their work. So again, how do we loan these materials without getting uh, running afoul of this, this ex exclusive right that's owned by the copyright holder? Well, that's because of another exception called first sale. First sale says, notwithstanding section 106.3, again, just that part of the bundle, just that one stick, notwithstanding that one stick, the owner of a particular copy, and when they mean owner here, they mean a possessor, person that has purchased the work or acquired it lawfully. So the owner of a particular copy uh, is entitled, without the authority of the copyright holder, to sell or otherwise dispose of the possession of that copy. Now again, we take this for granted, but I, I want to think this all the way through. Um, so the, the idea that entire industries have been built on this first sale right. Now it wasn't named first sale, uh, until later, it's actually better term for it is exhaustion, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but libraries are permitted to lend copies of printed books they acquire, use CD stores, used record stores, used bookstores. eBay relies on this provision. Imagine if we did not have this. If we did not have this, then every single time something was bought, sold, or lent, you would have to either get permission or pay a fee, but that's not how it works. The first sale doctrine enables something which is referred to as the secondary market, which libraries are very much part of. We buy the book ourselves and then loan it to people secondarily, or we acquire used books and add it to our collections. Again, it doesn't really require a sale. It's it, exhaustion is the better term. Um, because for a library, an archive, a museum, or any other cultural institution, certainly we get stuff by per purchase or acquisitions, but we also get donations. We also get bequeathments. Um, if you if you ask me um, how many times uh, that I thought I would uh, you know have to read a will on this job, I would say zero, but I was wrong. We libraries archives get stuff bequeathed to them and wills consistently. So is this a familiar system to everyone? Right? This is the system we are used to. You acquire a copy, 
It's checked out to one person at a time for a limited time period. It is then returned and it's made available to the next person. Repeat, I know it's simplistic to talk about this, but you can do all this without permission from or more fees paid to the copyright holder. You paid right here. Once you paid your dues or acquired it legally, you're done. There's 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 exhaustion. There's no more access for the rights holder to uh, prevent downflow access to these materials. Now, this is our book loaning workflow, right? One acquired copy, checked out, et cetera. This is our reserves workflow, one acquired copy, limited time period, probably more limited than the checkout period. This is our interlibrary loan workflow, right? One acquired copy, checked out to another, not a person, but another person at another library, maybe. Um, but again, we should be very familiar with this. It's something that we distinctly take advantage of, but maybe not think about. Now, here's the rub. It's the 21st century, though. We have things that are no longer physically available. They may be electronically available, and this is the this is the issue that we have. Now, again, issues with sharing our current collections and issues sharing our future collections. Let's just look at for a moment of what's going on with this shift from print to digital that affects these collections. So many of you remember in 2011 when HarperCollins first introduced its 26 checkout limit on eBooks. Now, this was unusual because it was it was one of the early ones that it said 26 checkouts mimics the lifespan of the books. Right, so we, you know, we're book weevils. <laughs> they want to make us pay. Um, and this is kind of oh, as a shocker because I know many of you probably have works in your collections that have been checked out more than 26 times that haven't fallen apart. I know in my library we will, you know, we will glue the binding on, we will put it in a box, we will make that book last. So to have a 26 checkout limit is kind of amazing. Every 26 checkouts, it's like you got to buy the book again. Uh, eight years later, Macmillan uh, later backed off, but they announced a two-month embargo on library ebooks, and they actually said out loud, which is amazing, that um, libraries were cannibalizing their ebook sales. Now that's an amazing statement. Um, so they're saying, well, we're just going to cut them off from this, right? And that we're not we're not going to sell to them. So again, not only do we have 26 checkout limits or you have to buy your collection every two years, now we have, oh, and we can't get them right away either. And then most recently, DPLA made a deal with Amazon um, to, to provide ebooks. But again, this was not, uh, you know, any type of thing where we could uh, claim total victory, I think, um, because, you know, we had a two year license. So we had, we could buy our collection again every two years, or we could buy bundles of 40 lens or five lens, right? Or the classic 26 lens, which was started in 2011. So, you know, that idea here is that it looks like that even the deal from DPLA continues to cast libraries as, I guess, renters. And we'll talk about this. And this is because the concept is that the area of contract law represented by this icon here is different than the area of copyright law and you can contract away any of the copyright rights you have including critical rights like first sale um and so just this year libraries attempted to put take this into their own hands right maryland said all right you know what we're gonna do uh we're gonna pass a law that says if you sell an ebook in the state um you have to sell it to libraries too well Many of you probably know a lawsuit was filed against the state of Maryland by the AAP, and the court ruled that the ebook law was unconstitutional. Same thing happened in New York. Right? Um, New York passed a bill that said, hey, we're going to ensure that public libraries have the right to get ebooks and they can't embargo us. No, vetoed by the New York governor because fear of litigation by the AAP. So, all of these, you know, when we do get a law <laughs> here, uh, it, you know, we're not allowed to take our destiny in their own hands with this. Um, so I think part of it is my concern that the end result is libraries might turn into Netflix, right? Because we are renting or leasing these ebooks. Uh, we don't own them and we can't keep them. And that's that's the reality of it, right? Never go to a, uh, a you know, you go to a Netflix show where it says, you know, hey, uh, you know, 30 more days to watch this movie and it's leaving Netflix. And that's because the Netflix license has expired. Well, the same thing can happen to libraries for their ebooks. Borrow this for the next 30 days. Now, this is odd for libraries and archives, right? Because certainly we're used to purchasing a work and having it available for more than 26 checkouts for as long as it will survive, right? As long as we keep it alive. 
Um, so it, it's it's that idea that. And this is Heather Joseph came up with a statement that I'm concerned and she was concerned that we're going to swap out the library card for a credit card. The idea somehow that we're incapable of keeping our collections or renting them and therefore unable to take advantage of for sale in the digital space. This is problematic. Now that's all problems with our future collections and sharing those, right? Check. But what about our current collections? What about what's currently on the shelf, right? What about the stuff that we spent millions of dollars on? Well, libraries have a 20th century problem with regards to digital access to those works. Um, and just for the moment, I'm going to use an example from BHL, the Biodiversity Heritage Library. It's one of my favorite libraries. Digitized works available full text online, right? So here's the handbook of birds of Eastern North America. I just thought it'd be interesting. So I can get a full text of this. And this is an older one, right? So BHL does a good job as a library in scanning these materials. But as you can see here, um, right about here, <laughs> It drops off right about where the public domain picks up right here. So their availability of digital materials is much less for the modern era. Now, is that because people weren't publishing biodiversity articles in? No, if we look at the new number of names published since 1864, publications are trending upward in the biodiversity. So there's a large corpus of here yet to be scanned. And the reason it's not scanned is concerns over copyright. Additionally, if we look at the commercial element of this, new books from the Amazon warehouse, obviously books in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, even halfway through the 90s, there's not many being sold. And that's because these books are largely out of print or not available anymore. Only the most famous of books from the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s are still being published, like Lord of the Rings, et cetera. So as I said or alluded to at the beginning, under copyright law, Libraries generally do not need permission to share the materials they purchased or acquired because we are already using electronic document delivery, digital interlibrary loan, virtual reading rooms, right? Our users are in the digital space. Why are we suddenly restricted from sharing in that space? Well, I theorized a few years ago something called controlled digital lending. I'm going to finish up and talking about this, um, which said, hey, what about those collections that are on our shelves that never made the jump to digital? You know, never made that jump. We know that they're not for print anymore. They're not uh, probably available anywhere else. They're not being sold currently. So CDL enables a library to circulate a digitized title in place of a physical one in a controlled manner. Now I wrote about this online. We have an update to the paper coming out soon, but I just wanted to tell you this is a way to share. Methodologically, it combines the best of first sale, fair use, and technology we have today, right? Ensure that the works are acquired lawfully, right? So there were we own these books. They are not licensed. These are not about the ebooks. This is about what's already on our shelves and that we limit the number of uh, copies that we have in digital circulation to the number of physical copies. That's called an own to loan ratio, like one to one. I have one book. I can loan it one to one user at a time. And again, a single user at a time, just as a physical copy. And we limit that time period. And then we use DRM, which is not my favorite, but we prevent wholesale copying and redistribution by the user. So it's like they open up a book and online on their phone, on their tablet, and they could just read it, turn pages. Now we're careful about this, right? Maybe we 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 pick certain collections that are materially uh, low risk, um, and you make a digital copy of that initial work, and then you hide the physical one away, right? I picked a salt mine here, right? You hide it away so the public can't have access to it, right? Locked doors downstairs in the basement an off-site repository and then this is the one that gets loaned with technical limitations now all of this has been happening this is not new it's been done for a decade actually a hundred libraries and publishers have harnessed a cdl system to loan digital copies boston public library georgetown mit mit press is doing selected back catalog so is houghton mifflin harcourt so some publishers are on board the brick house cooperative just started doing this um, there are a bunch of journalists that got together and they want to actually sell works to libraries that are digital to be loaned and probably the most famous version of cdl what came up during the uh pandemic closures was uh hathi trust so the emergency temporary access service, right? Hathi members and their patrons could check out a digital book for an hour. Access renewed at the end of that hour. Unless another user requested it, you could click return early. Again, does this sound familiar? <laughs> one acquired copy, checked out to one person at a time, limited time period returned, made available to the next person, right? Hathi was doing this too. And this is because my last point, 
physical collections as friction is an important thing, right? So copyright, lending, and friction are, are things that are really interesting. If the library owns a legitimate copy of the work and the physicality, first sale lets you have many people access it. But you have to wait your turn. What if we could use the technology to enhance sharing and decrease that turnaround time? Once the user is done, it transfers right to the next user. It presents that friction, like waiting at the desk, waiting for the truck to arrive, waiting for the interlibrary loan van to drive around campus, right? The next person gets it. And what it does is something very important. It refutes the cannibalizing sales. And it says digital access, uh, digital loans do not negatively affect the market any differently than the legal uses already permitted by libraries when providing access to works physically. We've already purchased these books. We already own these books. And imagine uh, just for the moment, um, if we unearth everything that's in our collections and put it where our users are online, the, the space and the high scholarly value that assigned and the relatively low risk of those works. Let's let's go where our users are, share our collections digitally, uh, and and make the best decisions we can about the risk for this. So uh, I ran a little bit longer than I intended. Um, I see there's some stuff in the chat. I don't know. I wasn't watching chat during this. I don't know if there's I've been any watching questions. it for you. Oh, good. Thank you so much. <laughs> That was fantastic. Thank you. And please, uh, folks, continue to put your um, your questions into the chat, or if you'd prefer to ask it out loud, raise your hand and I'll unmute you. We do have one from um, Jim Rickerson. Um, yeah. Would 108C protect a library if they copy a movie to Microsoft Stream and make it available as an electronic reserve for a film class? Uh, 108C is not uh, good for uh, for film, unfortunately. Auto visual works are negated from 108C. That's the bummer, right? However, maybe it's a fair use. I know this is not a fair use lecture. I was talking about sharing and our, our laws and rules we have now, um, but uh, there's always the potential for fair use, not necessarily section 108. Good right, I think you're, Jim, your, your point there about it would be on reserve for a class might be your-, your uh, Yeah, that might be your key to the yeah. equation. And again, um, I, I'll invoke the Peter Hurdle rule here. Peter Hurdle, a famous archivist, does all sorts of stuff. Um, and he's a copyright expert, although he always tells her I don't have a law degree. Uh, he, he always said, you know, part of risk assessment is the who's going to get mad rule. <laughs> um, and I always found that interesting. If they're not going to find it out, they're not going to get mad, then it might be OK. That's a great question. And then a comment from um, Susanna there saying that the, this is where the Internet Archive is focusing its digitization on those, you know, um, the time period that you were talking about. We desperately yes. tried to donate to them thousands of books we needed in that time gap. The problem is about state laws, the Georgia state law that um, uh, wouldn't allow us to do that. There are some specific yeah, yeah, donations. You know, yeah, yeah, that's that's a very specific thing we're running into. But I'd like to imagine, uh, you know, does the advent of controlled digital lending affect how we're thinking about weeding? affect how we think about offsite repositories. Um, I like to think of it as preserving the power of the print. There's significant legal and fiscal value we have in our collections. And since we own them, kind of taking that uh, into our own hands, I think it would be very interesting. Um, you know, because the open libraries, which is their flavor of CDL at Internet Archive, is relying on a statistical method, right? If 100 libraries sign up, and we all say, hey, we have one copy of this. That's 100 books that could be loaned to various people. Not to mention, we're exploring the application of controlled digital lending to interlibrary loan right now as we speak. Um, right. So combining something traditional with something uh, advanced using that technology. And we are a member of Project ReShare, which I know is looking at controlled digital yes. lending. And um, also the entirety of the university system joined Hathi Trust. So yes. uh, I know they're still working through some of their um, uh, ability to to share the brittle loss and damaged books. Um, but yeah. we're hoping that they will figure that out. Yes, no. And, and here's to reading a text of a statute that wasn't written particularly well. <laughs> it's part yeah. of part of the job is to translate that thing for modern times. But I think there's a bevy of of of, of interesting reading into those works that I think um, will be um, interesting. Um, all right, we've got I, I know we're almost at time, but let's keep answering questions for as long as you're you're willing to, to stay. Sure, um, I'm, I'm, I'm hanging out. <laughs> all right, great. One from Shantae here. How do we navigate multiple people in a class wanting to use a digital copy at the same time? 
Ah, so there's the difference right there between controlled digital lending, where it's a one to one ratio, more like a reserves desk, right? So if there's only five books on reserves, only five people can have it at a time, right? So controlled digital lending uh, certainly dictates that. We can't make more copies, right, necessarily. So, so when you're dealing with that, that's where the, there's a distinct difference between ebooks, certainly, maybe depending on your license that you have. Uh, because again, we are not buying ebooks. We are leasing them, we are renting them, right? None of those are sales. Any of them are sales. Um, so in a class one to use a digital copy at the same time, if it's a full book, that's problematic, certainly. Um, if it's a chapter or two, now we're moving into fair use, right? Now we're moving into the Georgia State case. Right, which is obviously famous in, in, in your district, um, that idea that it could be a fair use to have multiple people access a single PDF chapter of something behind a LMS, you know, reserves wall, to, so to speak. All right, we've got one from Susanna here. She says it's slightly off topic, so feel free to defer. What do you think about the two acts in Congress right now? SMART and then the really new one, the Copyright Clause Restoration Act. Uh, OK, <laughs> um, so a couple things. The copyright, if copyright clause restoration act is alluding to the. Punishing Disney Act, which I think is what it's called. Um, it's I think that's what it's called. It's that's it's kind of lunacy. Um, you know, look, copyright policy makes strange bedfellows sometimes. And the concept here that um, the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, which I just talked about, was gave an additional 20 years, uh, not just to Disney, it gave it to everyone. And the way that law is written, um, it looks like they want to punish Disney, you know, because they stepped over the line by commenting on legislation in Florida, you know, supposedly. Um, it wouldn't just affect Disney. Um, and it would be really weird how you, okay, so certain people would have copyright for certain terms and other people would have copyright for other terms, Th that it really makes no sense. It bifurcates the process and it really is done not in the spirit and the name of um, what I perceive of as um, good policy. Um, however, there is. Um, now, as far as the SMART Act, um, that is more concerning because SMART stands for strengthening measures to advance rights, technologies, Copyright Act. Um, it's got bipartisan support and uh, it, you know, I I oppose it. Um, it would create a burden on libraries uh, by forcing them to censoring free expression online. So every digital platform or website hosting user uploaded content must use some sort of technological measures act as dictated by some committee or something like that. Um, the chilling effects of having content filters on free expression have long been documented both here and in Europe. So any filtering technology used to identify copyright infringement can sweep way too broadly uh, and will inevitably affect fair use and other things. And, and I think that's uh, interesting. All right, you got one final question and then we'll we'll wrap it up here. Um, sure. One's from Jessica, uh, and I think I know how you're going to answer this one. Uh, so if a library purchased one book and digitized it, then they could legally share the copy and sidestep the ebook limit. Oh, there we go. Now we've got to now we get to the gravy. All right, so. <clears throat> you legally purchase a book, right? You look at this book now. So what's the book? When's the book? Whatever. There's risk factors about the book itself. It's 1960s something or it's a 2022 something. You have to determine whether or not there's a, there's a chance that the ebook market would override your ability to to use the CDL. So CDL is based on both first sale, which we talked about in detail and fair use, right? And this is not a fair use lecture, but the last factor of fair use is market harm. So the the idea here is that is this the same market? The the book that you buy physically and the ebook appear to me to be two different markets, right? The ebook you can do control find, you can search, it's got a clean interface and adjust font based on your thing. The book is just the book, right? I think it's a separate market, but we've had a lot of discussions about well, maybe we shouldn't focus on works that are modern that have an ebook market for purposes of doing our risk calculus for CDL. CDL is not a you know all or nothing approach. It's portions of your collections that you think are appropriate um, that probably don't have a digital market. 
um, to make those available to the community and see what happens. Again, we think they have potential high scholarly value because they've never been seen before online or anywhere else. There's no market for many of the books that are on our shelves. And the concept there is that, well, our, you know, my students say, unless it's online, it's almost like it's not real. What if we put all that stuff online? Then it becomes real. And if we pick things that have a low risk, I think that's a tension there. But I think that's a really great question, Jessica. And so that's where people are finding their their risco meter with regards to their collections and their needs. By the way, closing the lecture with risco meter <laughs> is a funny way. Yeah, well, that and um, let's see, book and ears also. Yeah, book and ears. Yeah, I think book you weevils, might have a market yeah. there for t-shirts. That is if an you amazing find. Uh, I'm yes. a bookaneer, and you could probably uh, <laughs> probably make some money off of that. Well, thank you all, you book and ears, for for hosting me here today. All right, thank you so much, Kyle. That was fantastic. Um, let's give um, Kyle a virtual round of applause here. And uh, thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. And everybody else, please enjoy the rest of, of Gagam over the next uh, today and today and the next two days. And um, hopefully, we'll see you all in person next year. Bye bye.